and like to get this thing going. So, uh, welcome to uh, welcome to the the startup after lunch here. Um, my name is uh, my name is Mark Seitz. This is uh, this is Nick Samus. We are from Dragos. Dragos is an industrial cybersecurity threat detection company. Uh, we have a, we have an intelligence team. We have a threat operations center, and we actually have a software product as well. So that's kind of the background on us. This is not a vendor pitch at all. What uh, what we're going to go into is going to be talking about threat hunting in the industrial environments. Some of the some of the constraints, some of the differences, some of the similarities on what we see on a on a daily basis, and and sort of the methodology, some of the the approach that that we like to take. Um, in, into into how we how we actually threat hunt here. So as you can see, this is get, this is what we want to be a fun presentation. We know it's right after lunch, second day of the conference. Uh, only only twenty or so slides here. We kind of want to make this interactive. Uh, leave time for some discussion after the fact. So uh, let's uh, let's actually just get into that. So the first part being, um, what what exactly is ICS, right? A lot of the times people people think about that is yeah, that's electrical power and that's that's oil and gas, right? Those are kind of the big ones that come to mind. Um, but what what else is there, right? So we, we have water treatment facilities. That well, that's kind of a big deal. Um, you know, manufacturing. So here, that you know, that one that's steel manufacturing, right? They're going to ro roll out uh, you know the coal rolled steel, do some of those things. But what else? Pharmaceuticals, right? A lot of a lot of industrial equipment, a lot of uh, precise measurements, a lot of a lot of batching that needs to be done uh, in order to make sure that we that we get the right drugs through there. Also, uh, food food processing, food manufacturing, those are all going to be parts of it. You guys have all seen like the how it's made videos. That's all going to be done by some sort of industrial controllers, right? Doing the same repeatable tasks. Also, transportation, right? Shipping. Uh, if you guys have a chance, like check out some YouTube videos on some of the, the newest uh, you know, shipping ports being built in, in uh, Shanghai and Singapore, right? Making artificial islands just because it's it's faster, more reliable, the, the automation processes to get ships in and out. Again, all done by, by industrial equipment and controllers. Trains, another great example. Right, those those all have to run. Those all have to understand exactly where they're at on the tracks and and what they're moving around. And most importantly, uh, beer. Right, you know, champagne and beers. Obviously, you guys all, all, all want a piece of that. That's all going to be done by industrial equipment. Right, these are industrial environments. Critical infrastructure, arguably most important critical infrastructure there. Um, so yeah, so so just give me a frame of reference of, of of the wider scope of industrial environments when we're talking about that. A bit. So generally, everyone's a special snowflake, and that's some of what we'll cover in this presentation. We'll specifically talk about the constraints. Um, what we're going to really hammer at is what makes ICS threat hunting different than just traditional or IT systems, as we call it. Um, we want to make sure, if, if you come away with anything else, the fact that a one-size approach, one-size-fits-all approach between both of those computing environments is not viable, and we'll present some of those challenges. And, and that's a really good point you bring up. Everyone is a special snowflake in that domain, where we do see similarities in vendor and protocols per industry vertical. For instance, food manufacturing typically relies on the same kind of vendors. Every, every environment has nuances, and we'll talk about some of the approaches we use to get around that. Um, so Mark, Mark gave a, a quick background of a couple different industrial environments by a show of hands is does everyone when we think of ICS do we all think of those environments is that is that normal or is that revelatory to a couple people that's normal okay so I just want to kind of kind of gauge we want to give that high overview we also want to give some technical details um, when we say operational technology who would say I'm familiar with operational technology in this room familiar with it okay and if I am I not loud enough no re repeat the last question Oh, the last question. Got you. So the question was, um, how specific are our industry verticals? Do we see the same vendors? Do we see the same protocols? Um, and again, the answer is everyone is a special snowflake. We do see trends um, between manufacturing, between transportation. We're going to see some, some trends there. Um, if I say, and last question, if I say um, Modbus function code analysis, by a show of hands, I, I sort of understand what that means. Okay. Cool. So we're, we want to give a, a, an introduction and, and show how these are some of the challenges we deal with and how we get around that. Um, a brief background, we're not going to get into intel, we're not going to get into um, a specifics of threat hunting, but just a brief background on ICS tailored incidents in the past couple years. Um, 
I won't go into detail on any of these, but the main takeaway here, um, and I'll direct you to, to a lot of the research that we have in the, the public space on our website, um, we do a lot of good information to get out to the public on what happened to these incidents and what are the main takeaways. And the main takeaway from a couple of points that we see here is that in the public domain there's a small sample of evolving threats. Um, as you mentioned, these threats that we're seeing are tailored because everyone is unique in some kind of capacity. The landscape that we need to look at is very specific to the kind of domains that we're looking to protect, the kind of system we're protecting. You want to talk about what is threat hunting? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so before we really, really get a chance to talk about the constraints or limitation of limitations of hunting in these environments, we have to make sure one we understand what ICS operational technology is. You know, started to cover that a little bit. Now we need to make sure we're on the same page with what threat hunting is, right? So. Fun definition, because everybody loves the definitions. And, and of course, like we're bringing that, we're going to bold it, we're going to highlight it, we're going to do all that fun sort of stuff. But great, so we know it's, it's a proactive approach, it's analyst driven, you know, you can look through some of these things, it's TTPs, but really, what does that mean? Right? So this is, this is something we've done, we've done a, a lot of work on. So maybe it makes sense to actually start with what it is not actually, because we actually see a lot of times it's, we're not arguing about the definition, we're arguing about its actual implementation. So, if we bring up something like it, it's a notification, right? We see we see an SMB file share uh, access. That is not threat hunting. That was we're, we are we are seeing some sort of alert. That's not a proactive approach. We have something telling us there might be something wrong with your system. Same thing with hey, the RDP connection. Well, we know that remote access could potentially be you know. It, and that, you know, damaging to an environment. It, you, there's a lot of things you can do. There's a lot of lateral movement you can do, but that is still not threat hunting, right? You can threat hunt on uh, uh, RDP connections, but actually coming from an alert perspective, having something tell you what's going on, a little bit different. So, if you just want to read that for a second, right? Some of the some of the, the things we want to talk about is 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 hypothesis development. Right. When you're talking about proactive, the analyst-driven steps, the manual process of I'm going to look through data, I want to target my approach. I want to focus what I'm what I'm going to be doing. So I, I have to come up with a hypothesis. I have to figure out, hey, uh, I think an adversary is leveraging an approved VPN connection, right? I have VPN connections in my environment. Could be from contractors, could be people working from home, whatever it is. Right? Using remote connections. So now when we talk about remote connections, that's RDP, that's VNC, right? There's a number of, you know, WMI. All kinds of different protocols. We're essentially opening up our scope there, but refining it to remote connections. Now I'm talking about the next action. You know, they're using those remote connections to move laterally to to change a PLC program, right? Now I have an action. I'm hunting for some sort of program that's now going to change in my environment based on a PLC asset identification. And now I, I'm going to say that that program is going to cause a PLC stop. Maybe I know that, that if that PLC stops, I now see downtime. I now see that there is, is risk to the people that I have on the manufacturing floor. Whatever the consequence is there, I know that a PLC stop is going to be damaging to my environment. And then I'm going to time bound. I'm going to say during the 4th of July, we have a lot of, lot of people out, you know, and that may be you know, more of a time for, for people to, to try and get in. Right. That is essentially what we're looking at is going to be something that we want to see. We want to take these actions. We want to say, yep, we're looking for VPN connections. We're looking for remote, remote access. Um, maybe it's specifically RDP because that's what we use in our environment. And we're sort of chaining those behaviors together. This is going to be a, hypo hypo a hypothesis of some artifacts that I can now go look for. So a couple things to note about, about threat hunting, right? We're looking for some of those unique behaviors. If I do something manually, I'm hopefully looking for something that is unique from the perspective of I've done it for the first time in my environment. After the fact, I want to automate that. I want to go be looking for new things. I want to continually, you know, we'll talk about auto automation footprint. But I want to be proactively searching through data. Right. I want. I want to have hypothesis development. I want to see what the coverage is across. Um, you know, maybe uh, you know the the ICS kill chain. Right. Could, you know, being able to look at at coverage in my environment, automating after investigation, and this. Is, and again, important to mention before we get into really the the the, the OT and IT side of things is going to be, this is not an automated process. Threat hunting is not something you can automate. You can automate threat hunting after the fact. You know, what we talked about file share access. Maybe you do a hunt that is looking for file shares that are being accessed. Great, you now have an automation footprint where you have the ability to triage that notification. 
Same thing with the remote connections. Right? There should be a hypothesis that leads you to that. So eventually, when you see an alert like this, that is that is the steps that I want to, uh, to go through. I want to be smart about how I, how I use Threat Honey in my environment. So that that kind of gives the basis of, of what we're looking at for Threat Honey. It's going to be a proactive approach. It's going to be something that you know it's unknown territory for your environment. It may be something that someone's been able to automate before, but you really need to do some of that manual work up front. Because again, we talked about the special snowflake cases. Yes. What is the PLC program? PLC program. So programmable logic controller. So what that is, it, it's uh, essentially a computer that is designed to do specific tasks. And you can upload a program to it to perform those various tasks. Now, um, uh, we, won't, we won't get too far into to exactly what it is, but um, essentially just it, so li limited functionality to do very specific purposes, very specific tasks. So um, to, to generalize that quickly, um, just to talk about what we lump into operational technology, a PLC is one example of a, a controller, something that actually physically changes the environment that it lives in. Um, effectively, it's an embedded, embedded device that runs typically some kind of proprietary software, speaks proprietary protocols, um, and controls processes at the end of the day. Um, all of that lives under the family of what uh, we typically call operational technology. Um, we can't have an operational technology presentation without having the IT verse OT slide, so that's what this is. Uh, traditionally, we view these computing environments as completely separate, and we'll see IT as this bubble, and it's things that we deal with on a daily basis. It's mobile devices, it's Windows workstations, it's email servers, and then we put this other bubble on the other side saying this is OT. This is where PLCs live, this is where remote terminal units live, this is where a hardened industrial component uh, switching infrastructure lives, and then somehow in the middle here, this is where the dragons live. Like everything's neatly and uh, nicely organized, and we say, "Cool, we're, when we go do an OT threat hunt, we're going to go look at that because that's where bad things happen." Um, in reality, that's not really how it works. In reality, IT versus OT is like a pizza. Um, we have a heterogeneous mixture of various computing uh, computing components that are mixed within. If we have a pepperoni pizza, I'm not going to bite into one piece of dough and my next bite is going to be all sauce, and my next bite is going to be all pepperoni, and I miss some cheese in there. And similarly, when we think about this from a threat hunting perspective, we need to be prepared and understand the entire contents of a slice of pizza at all times. Um, operational technology isn't anything that is not IT. It's things that include um, you know, standard technologies that are commonplace within IT. SMB, DNS, these all have a very important role typically in industrial environments. So how we understand how all of those various components play together is very important for how we threat hunt. Um, in this case, we've got some IT scattered and you have a bunch of other stuff that you've never seen that we'd classify as OT or that we don't even know was there to begin with. The second IT versus OT slide, um, this is what we call the Purdue, Purdue reference model. Um, basically, it's a way to theoretically and conceptually organize the computing that occurs in an, in an industrial space. At the bottom, level zero, is where we have field devices. These are sensors. These are pump controls. These actuate and sense from the physical world. Those speak to level one devices, and a PLC is an example here, a controller. Above that at level two is the supervisory plane in which we're having humans actually monitor processes. We have human machine interfaces so I can see what computing and uh, components are actually sensing from the physical perspective. It's how we build that human gap. Uh, above that, we have operations and support. As we're moving up this stack, we're getting a little more IT, a little more commonplace. Facility network is probably where a lot of your more standardized uh, IT components are going to live when we think of, of standard computing environments. And then level five is, is enterprise. So we have our enterprise, we might have a link down into an operational environment where more of that specialized OT equipment is going to live. This is typically how um, IT and OT environments are, are promised. 
in reality, it's significantly more compressed. This is how it's typically delivered. And that's why if we take an approach of, we're going to go look at all the IT stuff today, and tomorrow we're going to look at all the OT stuff, this is where a lot of threat hunt fails. It's because we're not, we turn that IT lens or that OT lens off at a given time, rather than understanding both of those environments throughout an entire hunt. Put more simply, it's promised to Aron Swanson, and we got Aron Swanson. <laughs> so with that, understanding a little bit of background there, we wanted to talk about um, some of the unique constraints. What makes IT versus OT different? And we're going to have four bullet points that we want to talk through. Want to do the first two? Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, it, you know, just to, to add, add more meat to that, right? I mean, it, coming, coming in, into that, you know, the ICS space, you know, kind of doing some of the first threat hunts and you start to see some of the, some of the weirdness there. It's like, ah, oh, we are looking at Ron Swanson. It, it really, it is the same person, right? You just, you know, you have to have, look at things through, through a different lens there. Um, but right, so, so talking about uh, legacy systems, really, that's, that's one of the first kind of constraints that we see in this environment. And we talk about legacy, right? We will address the old, like, old Windows versions, right? Things that are, you know, way, way out of date, way out of, um, you know, out of patching, all that kind of stuff, right? So, so things that we see typically, Windows XP, uh, we've seen some some Windows 95, right? S like systems that are that are put in the environment that just keep running, right? It, it, it's the mindset of it's if it's not if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? And, and from from the engineering side, from the plant side, there's no reason to go upgrade that box or or fix it or patch it because they need to keep the process running, right? If if you're if you're an oil oil gas refinery, you need to make sure that you are continually refining oil 24/7, 365. That is the mission of that plant. So changing that that Windows device. You know, when cybersecurity folks come in, it's like, hey, we need to patch that device. It's, well, what is it? How is it going to affect, you know, my production, my output right now? Because if you leave me down for an hour, right, and, there's, and you're trying to troubleshoot, trying to figure things out, well, I've now lost an hour of production time, right? And now you become responsible for that as, as a plant owner. The other thing that we, we want to talk about with just legacy systems are things that we run into all the time, right? Plain text, hard-coded passwords, um, readily available inside of inside of manuals, right? Lack of encryption, lack of authentication, lack of logging capabilities. Um, those those are things we typically see from all kinds of devices. So, at, a, at at another level, though, what we would talk about is even if you wanted to make something, you know, tunnel through SSH and set, right? You want to securely access your boxes. You want to go patch. You want to go do some of those things. There are devices that legitimately just do not support that, right? Telnet is the way that you will access that device because SSH is not a protocol that it will be able to speak, right? You have to understand those limitations. And when you see Telnet in the environment, have it not be, a, oh my gosh, that, that's crazy. It's okay, well, let's understand what's inside of it. What, what more can we understand about that device? So uh, one of the war stories I want to put behind this is we were, we were performing a threat hunt at a solar and natural gas facility down in, uh, down in California. We were working through their, so their devices, we were looking at their, at, at their threat hunt, looking at the backbone of, of, of their environment. We found a bunch of Cisco devices. Their, their entire Cisco backbone chain was massively out of date and unpatched. And we went back to them and, and we kind of knew this was going to happen, but we said, hey, recommendations are, are these three options for it. What do you think you can do about it? And they said, actually, we, we know that that's a, that, that is a thing. We can't do anything about it because the vendor that supports those devices and, and supports our control system won't let us update without invalidating our support contract. So as, as, that, as that kind of facility, right, if you have downtime and, and it's something that the vendor needs to come and fix, you need them on contract. You need them to get in. They need to be boots on the ground to fix that so you're, so you're back up um, with your operations. For them, they have to keep that system out of date and unpatched or they have to go rebuild their facility and bake in a new contract with it, which you're talking three to five years of rebuilding a plant, not, hey, we're just going to keep operations up. So that, that's the big thing that we want to talk about with that first thing of leg legacy systems. The second part that I want to talk about is going to be the uh, proprietary devices, software protocols, trying to get an understanding of what the, the vendors in this space are actually doing. Not from the security perspective, but just from the keeping everything running. How do we get the, you know, the cookies 
actually shipped out to the trucks and making all the way through their cycle. Anything with that, that degree. So a couple ones I want to throw out, throw out here are uh, Rockwell. And you guys may be familiar with them or not. They're, these are uh, essentially automation vendors or just control system vendors. So Rockwell, they tightly control access to their customer portal. They really don't have much uh, that's, that's public out there that you can go and just you know, grab from, from online. And they charge a premium to access some of their extra data, even if you're a, you are a customer. Schneider, they implement their own. So some of you guys said you were familiar with Modbus. Modbus is an open open standard protocol. You can it, it's uh, very widely used, commonly accepted. Well, Schneider actually made their own version of that. All right. So now not only do you have to understand regular Modbus, you have to understand the changes that they that they've implemented on top of that. Emerson. Emerson, essentially, their protocol stack is, is built on old protocol stacks. So not only, again, do you have to know what they're doing, the new things that they've done is, what does the base protocol do? And again, trying to figure out where you where you can find that information. Uh, Yokogawa, some, some of the same things, right? And what we talk about there is, how do we actually figure out this information? Is there stuff available online? Like, do, do we have to reverse engineer it ourselves, potentially? Or can we get some sort of partnership where, where we kind of figure those things out? It's all a necessity for us. One of the biggest challenges that, that we've now seen is that vendors coming out with new products boast interoper interoperability across all sorts of other vendors. So Honeywell is now having the ability to integrate with Yokogawa and Schneider and Rockwell. Great. Now I have to understand all those different uh, those different devices when I go into into threat hunting these environments. So really, what we're trying to show you is that this presents a challenge to to the threat hunter in this environment, right? And again, it's going to be different because each each facility that you're going to be into is going to be a little bit different as well. So again, it's it's ultimately harder to find what is normal because you have to figure out what's going to be normal first, and even even understanding what the facility is going to be defining as normal as well. Another constraint that we see more heavily in an operational environment is the notion of a system. What would be my this is at the end of the day, operational technology is keeping a facility up and running. It's it's what makes a refinery a refinery. It what make it's what makes a train run. Um, in typical computing environments, IT. Uh, you might just have a whole host of workstations, and as users change their roles or execute their job functions throughout the day, they use different software, they use different uh, technologies, they use different protocols, but at the end of the day, the, the workstation doesn't really change, right? You have a, a standard IT build. In OT, identities really matter. We have a workstation for a very specific purpose. If that workstation has the HMI software, the human machine interface software, I can't just do the, the job of, a, of an engineer that's not an operator. If I want to go change the software that, that lives on an embedded device, I need to have a specialized piece of hardware and associated software for that. So identities very much matter. Why that presents a challenge is that we need to understand from the technical perspective what that identity really is trying to do. This device is trying to execute these kind of functions, and for the challenges that Mark has identified, if we have closed protocols or protocols that we don't understand, it's our responsibility to go figure out what that actually means so I can see what that device is trying to do. Similarly, these devices, as they execute functions, they're all typically pretty critical. If I have a component in an operational technology space, it's probably there for a reason. One of, the, one of the trends we're seeing um, over the past year or so, and you guys have probably seen in the news, is we're seeing a lot of opportunistic um, ransomware targeting industrial firms. In typical IT environments, if I have backups, great, I can isolate the ransomware incident, I can flash those machines, and I can get users back up and running. I'm going to put the same build on there and I'm going to say, hey, sorry, we're going to, you know, resync your, your email outbox and we're going to, um, you know, resync your, your messages at the end of the day, no problem. In OT, I need to go figure out what software packages were on that thing. I need to go figure out the exact configuration, the software build that I need to put specifically on that unique machine. And these present significant different challenges because that's not a uh, you know hit the flash button and we're good to go similarly um, one, one further point um, tying network actions to system identities is important um, being blind to protocols is one such challenge for us 
But at the end of the day, even if we understand a protocol, we still need to build context behind that protocol. So identifying that a device is speaking Modbus is significantly different than this device is querying registers and actually executing um, register changes to its subordinate devices. Building that context and having our homework done ahead of time is really important on the notion of a system. The fourth thing we'll talk about is uncertainty. Um, in industrial environments, the systems are typically rather deterministic via either operational constraints or artificial constraints because nobody's tried anything unique in these environments. If I built up a system 30 years ago, I don't have a bunch of hands in the pot trying new things. I don't have operators that are downloading new software packages um, because it can make you know animated GIFs out of my videos. And I don't have that kind of uncertain behavior on my operational environment. When we go into these environments for a pen test or for a threat hunt, that brings uncertainty to, to operators. And that uncertainty causes a lot of uh, hesitation with people that own these systems, rightfully so. So in order to get around that uncertainty, we need to, via tribal knowledge, via expertise about being in these environments, understand the challenges and build unique tactics to get around those. So things that are, you know, kind of commonplace in IT environments, being able to, to fire off a scan to collect a bunch of information, even if we understand how to collect that appropriate information, uh, there's hesitation around that because that kind of scan has never been fired off before. We've never done this kind of thing, and I'm not going to do that on my operational environment for the first time ever. Log collection. In IT, we can typically go say, let me go look at the auth log. Let me go look at the event log. In OT, we don't always know how to pull those, or we don't even know if logging is enabled on some of these devices. Similar with debug information. Um, we like to call the availability of information very special. And this kind of comes back to um, one of the original questions at the beginning. Everything is a special snowflake because some environments, um, based on how it was implemented, based on how operators are actually implementing the system, you might have a trove of information, you might not. You might have no idea what kind of debugging information is available to you, but it might be sitting on a, a random syslog server. Or uh, on, the, on the other side of things, you might have absolutely no, available, uh, no information available to you. So I want to talk through one specific use case. Um, we talked about how proprietary protocols present a challenge. We'll talk through an open protocol here. Um, Modbus is a fully open source protocol. It's integrated into a lot of standard um, security or, or network analysis tools out there. Um, Zeek, formerly Bro, has a Modbus parser built into it. Um, we can use them in their default configuration to get some kind of information based on network flows. But if we just do that, just use it in their standard configuration and don't understand operationally how it's used, it typically yields information that is insufficient. So on the right side here, is anyone familiar with, with what a Modbus log looks like? Or is this new to everyone? Okay. This is generally new. So what we see here, it's similar to a con log from Zeek. And what we've done is analyzed um, a source IP address speaking to a destination IP address over port 502, which is what Modbus speaks on. And there's a concept within the Modbus protocol of a function code. And when we see read holding registers here, that's what that function code actually means. So in this case, 192.168.112.21 is, is executing a read holding register command to 192.168.112.50.52 and 51 also. And this is what Bro in its default configuration will give us. So we say, cool, great. We're seeing the exact same behavior from one device to three different devices. And if we just use this information with no context, we don't have a lot to go off of. However, if we dig a little deeper, if I now start building some operational understanding to this, I can now develop a deeper hypothesis and say, based on my understanding, I know that uh, that master PLC should only be requesting from starting register X50. And if that's the case, I know all of its remote PLC should only be providing information back on, on just that register. I can look deeper in the packet, and I can pull that information out. In this case, if we plot it over time, great. We see every single read holding register request is initiated starting at 5.0. 
further with some additional information, we know that the Modbus spec, you give it a starting register for this function code and a number of bytes to read back. So if I build that one step further, I should say the master PLC should only be requesting six registers. Now if I can build this kind of analysis from a threat hunt perspective, my hypothesis of, it, my hypothesis of that master PLC is reading more information or it's trying to do some information collecting that it doesn't necessarily need to do, uh, I can immediately see some things stick out here. And in two instances, we're reading additional information that the system isn't designed for. Our operators don't understand why it would need to read those additional messages. So this is an example of how understanding our environment, understanding that operational context, we can go beyond standard analysis to really build that context in ahead of time and enable us during a hunt. Yeah, so so we talked a lot about the challenges there. What, what I want to apply that to is is a real life real life case study. You know, something something that we, that we actually run into. Like let's let's tie it to our threat hunt here. So what we're looking at here is uh, is a wind farm that uh, that we that we did a threat hunt on. What we see here is, is farm one farm one and two. They connect to an energy management system, right? There there has to be a way that you know when the, when each wind farm is producing energy that it, it's being balanced, it's going to the right place. So that all ties into the energy management system network, and then all the rest of the information goes out to the, the HQ corporate the biz uh, again to be able to access that information to be able to, to make it actionable um, and then you know uh, just be able to check in on the wind farms as well. So right from the get go, the challenges down on the left there are the proprietary and legacy challenges. So Etera Habitat is anybody familiar with what Etera Habitat is? Not at all, right? This was this is something new for us. We walked into is that's a, that's a unique control system. Right, that's a that is Etera Habitat is is a way that a lot of uh, wind farms and a lot of the electric sector um, actually use use that for their energy energy management, right? And has a very specific way on, on that it interacts with devices and stores information and allows things to be accessed. So one, that's a proprietary challenge because there isn't just you know the quick Wikipedia page on here's how Etera Habitat works. It's a proprietary system, right? The, a vendor a vendor is trying to compete with other vendors on my system is better than yours, so they're going to try and vault that information away. And also, the, uh, Modbus controllers. Again, open standard on things, got to understand what those, what those actually are. So moving to the next part, right? So if, let, let's, let's zoom down into one of those wind farms. Well, what we see from that is that there's a master device. There's essentially a master PLC, and then there's outstation PLCs. So it's again, one computer controlling the rest of them. And what that one in the center is, is essentially giving all the commands to all of the actual wind turbines uh, that, are, that are out in various locations um, you know, that, that actually make up the wind farm. Okay. Giving us, you know, the directionality here, we now identify that there's a system identity challenge, right? One of the, the that uh, that third bullet point that we talked about is what, it, you know, if I'm reading this, what does master actually mean? What does PLC mean? What does that mean as an outstation device? Directionality-wise, uh, I'm seeing that it should only ever be the master talking to the PLC. The PLC should never return information to that. Well, again, now I'm sort of, that's an identity challenge. I need to figure out what's actually going on. So when I threat hunt, if I ever see a PLC talking back to, to the master, uh, giving more information, what does that mean? Right? I have, to, I have to understand that. So the, the, uh, the weirdness that we saw from the threat hunt perspective was, um, was actually developing the hypothesis that, that centered around you know, other connections to those PLCs. If we know that only the master should be talking, is there something else that's talking out there? And we actually found that there were four IP addresses that were actually communicating directly to these PLCs. And that didn't make sense to us at all. So immediately it's like, oh shoot, we got, we got external IP addresses talking in. Uh, from what we know about the system identity, from the network layout, this should not happen at all. Well, it's now uncertainty. I'm now uncertain about, you know, from what I know about the system identity, should this or should this not be happening? Right, so now then my tactics are different. So you know, I'm looking at all right, what other information can we pull? Right, we're getting network traffic. Can we get host logs from those controllers. Uh, are those controllers even possible to, to even give us other logs? Can I even go request that the Astroner go and grab those? Right, do they even feel comfortable going to those those devices? Also, it's a wind farm, so you're talking about driving hundreds of miles just to go collect logs potentially. That was not the case, thankfully.
But what we, what we found out, though, uh, it was that they're, they're actually vendor connections. It was an external vendor out in Spain that was actually performing turbine resets. So what, what that means, essentially, when you have a, turb uh, a wind turbine that, that's up and, and the, um, the wind speed gets too much, the, the PLC will actually break, um, break the, the wind turbine. So it essentially slows everything down to a halt. You need, to, you need that turbine to be reset. So the vendor actually performs that connection, resets it so it can actually go to spin again in lower wind speeds. So we found that this was actually, these are persistent connections that are coming in, right? And they actually, the, the asset owner found a contract that for the next three years, this has to be the case, right? And when you talk about the legacy systems ownership, there's nothing the asset owner can do about that because when the control system was first put in, this was exactly how the legal documentation was set up. So that vendor will continue to have a persistent connection from a place that the asset owner uh, that actually owns the wind farm doesn't know where those IPs are coming from, doesn't know the security about those things, but that's how it has to be. That's now an operational challenge that they have to work with. And now when you're talking about threat hunting, this is not, this is not an, an alert that you get fired up about, right? It initially is, right? Because we go from that, oh my gosh, you know, to, all right, we have some context. Really, what really, you know, this is just, this is applying real life use case to everything we talked about here. So, what are the, what are the key takeaways? What are the approaches that, that you have to have? Um, Nick, have you hit one or two? Uh, yeah, so talking about some of the constraints, we want to be solutions oriented here. How do we build a tool set? How do we build um, a capability to help us in those challenges? Uh, the first one is doing our homework. We alluded to it a couple different times. Um, as Mark mentioned, if we have proprietary protocols, our homework is ahead of going into that environment. Let's understand how this protocol operates. Is this a pub sub? Does this require two-way communications? Is this only a, a UDP packet that we throw over the fence and hope that it gets there? Understanding all of these constraints from a protocol or a vendor level is really important. We should do that ahead of time. What that does is it reduces the burden of us, the analysts, when we're in the field. So using all of the time ahead of an engagement, we can build up a repository of information. We can build up specific tools for that engagement. Um, similarly, on the notion of a system, understanding how these systems typically operate. And I'll come back to the, the first question, um, which was how unique are things. If we've been in an industry before, we typically know how functionally energy management systems work. Are we going to look at every energy management system that's ever been created? No, that's not scalable. But understanding from a functional perspective typically how these work, we can now ask more pointed questions to quickly build up that information, that operational context. Two, define a methodology and a process and document um, the findings and the knowledge that you build along the way. If we just go in haphazardly and don't follow a regimented process, we're going to miss things. How we document our hypothesis generation is important so that when we go back into a second engagement in an, in, in an electric sector environment, we know what worked and we know what didn't really work. If we uh, understand something about a new protocol that, hey, this was really interesting, I would, as an adversary, I would use that against this kind of system. I want to be able to document that. So now during my downtime, I can build up a detection routine to support a higher level hypothesis. All of this information, um, we're a large team. Not every single person has seen every single system out there. Being able to share and codify that knowledge is important for us. Um, as a platform, uh, as a software development uh, company, we do have a platform. And understanding all of these things that we learn from the field, codifying that into the platform is important for us. So that when we want to go run an analytic to identify some additional information, that supports our hunt. We can actually use that because we've codified it before. Right, and that, that really leads in, into this last point here, right? This is probably one of my favorite gifts ever. <laughs> gotta enable that hunt. Gotta at least, gotta at least get yourself down a path where you're in a, a, you know, maybe an uncomfortable situation, an environment that you have no idea what's, what's going on. And there may not be a lot of research out there. You may have to do some of that work up front, right? Take those, those first two steps, enable it, then you gotta codify the knowledge, right? When you do it once, 
can you do it, you know, can you do it another time? Can you make this essentially not happen? Make, make the jump next time, right? And, and, you know, continually running that process, that's going to be enabling the hunt, codify the knowledge. We have, we have the benefit of, of being able to use a platform. There's also a lot of research that we put out there, right? Very, very community driven where it's, this is a big problem. It's not going to be necessarily solved by one company. It's going to be a lot of people that are getting into these environments because we're not going to look at every energy management system, right? Or even, and that's just one vertical that we're going to be looking in. Right? There's a lot more that we looked at when we talked in the front. I'm trying to look at more beer environments, to be honest with you. Uh, you get, sometimes you get some cool swag from those facilities. Wouldn't mind some beer on the way out. Um, but that's, that's, that's really, you know, codifying the knowledge and getting things out there. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's all, that's all we got there. Um, questions? Yeah, absolutely. So the, uh, those IPs, external IPs, were they connecting on the VOD bus path? Or were they coming in through some sort of gateway? Yeah, so the question was, what the external IPs, where were they, what, what kind of connection did they actually have, have, have in? So they were connecting over Modbus there, right? So the, the, way, that, the way that they came in, um, where they came in from the external side, but they had local IP addresses, right? So then they, they, from the local side, they were able to connect directly in over 502 to do those, the, those actual resets. Uh, how often are you able to ask like the engineers to design the system for like you know their homework? Because it seems like a lot of that you know the, the baseline stuff could you know be accelerated by just talking to them about how it's supposed to work. Right. So question being, um, how often do you get a chance to work, ask, ask these questions direct to the operators, the engineers, the ones that know the system, network operators? Um, yeah, please. In, in, uh, in two words, it depends. Um, and that's the worst answer ever. So again, I'll point, uh, again, this, this is a great, uh, I swear I didn't plant the question ahead of time. Everyone's a special snowflake, right? So you're going to go into environments where the engineers have everything well documented. They understand how the IT works. They understand which switch uh, control, uh, actually gets packets to where they need to go. On the other hand, you'll have environments where nobody's ever looked at this stuff. You've never had an outage. You've never had to document anything before. You've never had to run any, any solution down from an IT or OT perspective. Um, so it, depending on the environment, you have a, anywhere along that entire uh, entire range there. That said, what we typically try to do is codify that, that ahead of time so we can give them a, a questionnaire, right? Do you understand uh, your routing scheme? Do you understand if there are any firewalls present in your environment? Do you understand how external VPN communications can actually route to critical OT components? And based on that, we can then level set with how we can change our tactics around that. Because one such example is if you have absolutely no visibility, you can't give us an asset management inventory, you don't understand how packets get from here to here, that might change uh, our tactics on site to say, hey, we want to go to your backbone infrastructure and start tapping to build some of that context. And the, the other thing of that too is even if they have filled out the questionnaire, sometimes they'd say, well, like, oh, well you guys didn't... Um, good. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Um, yes, yeah, so, so sometimes they'll, they'll feel out there's like, yeah, we know how things are supposed to work. It's like, you get on site, it's like, okay, what's your documentation? It's like, oh, well, we're, we're just going to whiteboard it for you, right? And it's just one network guy, like, whiteboarding everything out. It's like, uh, shoot, I don't think that's right at all. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's exactly that. So you get, you get a varying range. Yeah? So, uh, obviously, uptime is important in these environments. What sort of redundancy do you see in those, and how does it affect your ability to help them recover? So, for instance, for instance, um, you have a device that is optimized. Is there another device that has the same configuration that's just cold waiting to swap that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so qu question being, you know, what do we see from the re redundancy perspective, right? How do the control systems are built that, uh, you know, help keep up time even, even after an incident? So again, it, this is, I'll, I'll take it first stab, and Nick, you know, probably, probably take this afterwards. But uh, it, it depends on the industry vertical that you're in, right? The electric side uh, being a regulated environment versus something like oil and gas or advanced manufacturing where they don't, um, there will be redundancy built into those systems. Uh, other times, we 
you know, from oil and gas perspective, it's uh, we have that one firewall or we have we have that one controller to do that job and that's it. Uh, a lot of the times from the incident response perspective, they will have already called in the vendor, they will, you know, to make sure everything's back up. Then what we come in after the fact is what's the root cause, right? A lot of the times they're not, they're not following the nice sans six step PICRA model of let's identify, let's scope, let's take that time and everything. It's just get everything back up. Like if we have to pay the ransomware fee, like we'll just, we'll just get out of the way. We'll bring somebody in after the fact to figure those things out. So even if they're redundant or not, right, they're gonna have those vendor contracts, they're gonna figure out a way to get everything back up and running in, in even you know faster time than, in a, than an IR team could really be on site. Um, any other thoughts on that? Yeah, one thing I'll offer, um, redundancy, there's a lot attached to that word, right? So when we're looking at putting in operational components, we look at redundancy through a certain lens and it's going to be process failure or a random ethernet cable fails. So the redundancy that we put in place is, yeah, I might have two switches, so I've got redundancy at L2, but I'm not going to think about redundancy from a cyber perspective. So now if I have all the exact same hardware across everything, and I know one packet can corrupt the firmware across everything, I don't have you know 10 guys waiting with 10 separate laptops to all go physically flash the firmware on those, Similarly, if I cause a hardware failure in some of these, I don't have 10 devices ready to be swapped back out. I might have one. Um, so thinking of that in the perspective of what are you, what are you building contingency plans for um, is, is a really important consideration. Yeah. So when you're in a setting where it might cost you know, millions of dollars per hour to have things well, go down, and you need to patch something, you need to update, how do you practically convince very risk averse people that it's worth their time? Yeah, that's that's the challenge, right? Uh, the the question is, if you're in very critical environments where where cost is a thing and downtime is resulting in millions of dollars of lost revenue per hour, how do you convince decision makers to uh, implement change effectively? Is that right? Yeah. So um, it's identifying the potential um, the potential threats to their risk. We don't come in and say, hey, we're smart and we understand the exact operational risk. What we can do though is identify tech, technological um, challenges, how threats can pose a, a, a risk to your risk model that you've already defined. And one such example, um, when you can come into an environment and they can give us a risk model to say, here's what my bad day really looks like, that's a gold mine for us. Because now we can look at that and say, how does the control system at the end of the day ultimately support what you care about, being able to scope what you care about? Um, we can now build a threat profile to say, here's how I can cause downtime, integrity issues, whatever it is to that control system in order to impact what you care about. Ultimately, you have to, you have to make the the risk of a, of a. Ultimately, you have to make the risk of a cyber attack outweigh essentially the, the effect of the downtime, right? If we're talking about millions per hour, right, from from the, that downtime where we're gonna we're gonna patch something, versus downtime to like millions of dollars, you know. I don't know, like like ten like so it's like ten million dollars a day kind of thing, right? You have to you have to, you have to make them make them do the math and figure out it, it's it's a worth worthy investment for me to take my facility down now, get things patched, get new controllers in there, do whatever it is uh, to get to a better place. Yeah. Uh, one question in terms of scanning. So during hacker scans, often it takes you know you knock out some of your ICS systems. How effective do you think? Your passive scans are versus having to do more of your traditional scans like you do on IT, where you can't do those on some of your own pieces. Yeah, so talk, talk about the difference of the active active versus uh, passive scanning. Uh, which one more useful? Because obviously, active scanning, you know, it may take down stuff in your ICS environment. Again, a lot of times when we when we look at these kinds of environments, you know, just establishing a what is in my environment from a visibility perspective isn't there. So from passive scanning, there's a lot more that we can get um, that just hasn't been looked into. Right from the IT side, when when you have that that ability to use an active scan, you're not really going to push the envelope on what you can get from passive in the OT side. When we when we look at some of those limitations and constraints, 
from the passive side, there, there's a there's a lot more that we're gaining. I mean, even even every day, just from a, a research and development perspective, on wow, I didn't know that this protocol actually passed this kind of information. Um, a lot of the times we talk about active scanning, getting host names, getting um, firmware versions, software versions, model numbers. We actually we're finding that in a lot of these protocols that they are passing it, but it's figuring out when it's being passed, how often, and can we actually grab it and parse it out? Because a lot of those things aren't there. <laughs> It, one, or, one other thing I'll add too is it's very implementation specific. So if you know there are certain protocols that exist out in, in the domain and I want to get a certain element of information out of there, a lot of times we can build a matrix to say these protocols are not going to support, even if I went with an active query, you're just not going to get that information you want, right? And I might need to get a profile of, of traffic passively for a week to, to achieve some objectives. Some other objectives, I want all the serial numbers, okay, whatever you're going to do with those, we could maybe go get those, but it really comes down to measuring the implementation versus what functionally can I actually achieve out of that? So are we out of time? One minute? One minute. Any final question? All right. All right. Thanks for coming. Thanks guys. for coming. I appreciate it.